Welcome to another beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Yes, you are doing physical sciences with me, Utobi Lenkosi. We are doing physics all the way from 5 o'clock all up to 6 o'clock. I want to thank Liberty for sponsoring the Tenfold Education Program. If you haven't downloaded the app, please do so and bring in those questions. So in today's show, we are doing electrochemistry now, one of my favorite topics. And in today's show, we're going to look at the difference between galvanic cells and electrolytic cells. What is the difference when we are looking at the different structures, when we're looking at calculations, and what is actually happening inside those galvanic cells, and why do we actually need it? Now, as we go along, I'm going to tell you why we need it, where we use it, and so forth. Because if you were, if you were asked to write, let's say, an essay question about why do we do electroplating, or how does a battery work, then you have information to give it along. So I'm going to go as deep as possible so that you actually understand where what comes from. So without wasting any time, let's look at our first question question for today. So the first question comes, comes from Doc Sikotishi and he says, what is the difference between a cathode and an anode? Now, something that you must remember is we've got electrochemical cells, galvanic, electrolytic. When we talk about a cathode and when we talk about an anode, it is compartments that actually work in these batteries, right? It's either they take the electrons in, they take the electrons out, or so forth. But something very crucial that you need to remember in grade 12, when we talk about cathodes and anodes, even though they generate electricity, it is where oxidation and reduction will take place. So then already in your head, you must go oil, rig, and ox, and red cat. And I'm going to show you how we break that apart. So to answer Mr. Doc Scottini, what is the difference between a cathode and an anode? One simple way to explain an anode, we can say it is an electrode. They are both electrodes. It is an electrode where electricity moves in, and this one is also an electrode. Let me just put my E, electrode. It is an electrode where electricity is given out. However, I can also add that on the anode, I want us to look here, an ox, at the anode we have oxidation. So when my anode is where oxidation takes place. And what is oxidation? Oxidation is oil rig, it is the loss of electrons, of electrons. And then when we look at, um, I forgot my E again, but when we look at something like a cathode, I want us to look here, reduction happens at the cathode. So red cat is short for reduction happens at the cathode. So at the cathode we have reduction. And what and where does reduction happen? When we have a rig from the oil rig, reduction is the gain of electrons. So this is a gain a gain of electrons. So that is one way in which we can put it in. But now this is what I want to look at. I've got a picture of a galvanic cell here, and we're going to go a little bit deeper to actually show you how what actually happens between this anode and cathode. Because they, this is one simple question they can ask you, but they can also ask you a bit more questions um, regarding this. So let's look at this diagram quickly. So if this is my galvanic cell, and then I've got two electrodes here, I've got zinc, uh, which is weaker and copper which is stronger. This is the zinc that I'm talking about, copper which is stronger. How do I know this? There's these tables that we use. We can either use a 4A standard table or you can use a 4B table. It depends which one you use or which one your teacher uses. I like using a 4B. So this is an increasing oxidation ability. So it increases moving downwards. So if I, was, if I had to find my copper, and I had to find my zinc, there's my copper there, and then I have to have my zinc somewhere up here. So if I had to find my copper and my zinc, I will then be able to tell um, what is happening. So let me just see if I can find my zinc here. There's my zinc there. So this is my copper, this is my zinc. It's an increasing oxidation ability, which means that copper has got a stronger ability to take away the electrons from zinc because it increases going down, meaning the more to the bottom it is, the stronger that they are. So between the two, copper is going to be a bully. So this is how I always explain it to my kids. If you are given two elements and you have to find where oxidation and where reduction takes place, 
you have a big bully, one which wants to take away the lunch of other children. In this case, we don't take away lunch, we take away electrons. So some of these elements want the electrons from all the other elements because they have the ability to do that. They are much more stronger, right, to take these electrons away, right? So they are gaining these electrons where reduction is taking place. And the poor other so very scared elements are losing their electrons, right? That is where oxidation is taking place. So when you have two, you must look at which one will be the bully. Bullies gain. They eat your lunch. They eat your lollipop. They take your tuck shop money. And if you're scared of the bullies, you lose everything. Oxidation and reduction. In this case, we're working with zinc and copper. So now I've showed you which one is stronger, which one is weaker using the 4B table. So now we've got two beakers when we talk about a galvanic cell. So here I'm going to have zinc solution. So I'm going to have zinc sulfate solution, which is ZnSO4. And this is my solution. In this side, I'm going to have copper, which I'm going to have CuSO4. So this is technically what happens. If I've got a zinc rod here, or what we call an electrode, this is just a wire. And in this wire, it's where the electricity flows. So here, if I was to just enlarge it, on this rod here, this is just enlarged, I've got a zinc particle that's holding onto this rod. And then the poor copper on this side wants to steal the zinc's electrons. Then it's it has the ability to take the electrons away from the zinc, right? Because the zinc must lose, it must go through oxidation. After the poor zinc loses its electrons, it falls into solution, right? So it starts off as a zinc solid, falls into solution, becomes aqueous. Then the electrons move all the way around and then they come to this side. Then we have a copper here in solution. And after it has attracted all these electrons, the copper goes da di da di da and then the copper will then embed itself on this rod right here. So the zinc will lose the electrons, fall into solution. Copper in solution will then be, at, will be attached to the zinc rod there. But they don't really get attached or so forth. They go through oxidation or they go through reduction, which means oxidation is the loss of electrons on this side and reduction is the gaining of electrons on this side. But then Tops, uh, why are you teaching us this? Now, watch this. Because zinc is losing electrons, oil rig is going through oxidation. It's going through oxidation. Where does oxidation take place? And ox, by the anode, we have oxidation. So my zinc represents my anode. By the copper side, I can see that the copper is actually taking the poor electrons. So that is where reduction is taking place. So this will be reduction. So what does this copper represent? Red cat reduction occurs at the cathode. So the copper represents the cathode. So this is one thing that we need to remember. So in an exam, they can ask you multiple or various ways on how to do this question. They can either give you this diagram, give you the zinc and copper, ask you to give a half reaction, identify where oxidation and reduction will take place, or give um, whatever details the examiner wants you to give. If you are struggling with that, go back to your 4B table, write down as much information as you can on the diagram that you are given, and then you can start answering the, the questions. Because most of the time, the, with questions like this, there are follow-up questions. They're gonna ask you, uh, which one represents the anode? Then you're gonna give them. Then they're gonna ask you, please write down the half reaction that takes place at the anode. Then you give it. Then they're gonna ask you, um, please calculate the cell potential of the anode. So you must be very careful that it is sequential questions that require the answer of the previous one for you to move on. So if you are, get, if you, if you are struggling, make sure that you do have this. Now I want to actually add something else, what the examiner might ask. So now that we have what's going on here where the zinc is and we know what's happening where the copper is, meaning where oxidation is taking place, that it, this is the anode, that this is reduction, and then this is the cathode. So now that we've identified those two, they can also ask you to write half cells. I want to start with this one. I'm going to name this one number one and I'm gonna name this one number two. The examiner can ask you to write a full reaction of what's happening. So let's talk to a story about the zinc. The zinc is initially on the rod, meaning it is a solid. So I've got zinc, it is a solid, it's a base X. Now because the zinc loses the two electrons, in chemistry, when we want to represent something that has lost electrons, we put them on this side of the equation sign. However, when the zinc loses two electrons, it becomes a zinc ion. It becomes Zn, how many electrons did it lose? Two plus. 
so it is more positive than negative. If you are struggling with understanding when is it more positive, when is it more negative, think about this. If zinc has an equal number of protons and electrons, right, but then it loses electrons and then it goes quonk, quonk, then it loses electrons, it is more positive now than negative. By how many? By two. Because if we add an electron, we add another electron, then they are equal. Remember? So a positive 10 minus Let's say positive 10 minus 10 is zero. That's a neutral atom. But if we reduce the number of electrons, we have an uneven number of ions or electrons by two. So that is why we have to say two plus. But now because we are in grade 12 and we learned about phases in grade 10 and grade 11, we need to indicate that. The examiner wants to see whether you understand that the zinc starts off as a solid, it falls into solution being aqueous, and then on the other side of the equation sign, that is where you then represent the number of electrons that the zinc will have. So this means on this side, you've got my zinc, my solid falls into solution, so this will become aq. Why does it become aq? Because my poor zinc was bullied of its two electrons. So that is what happens at the anode. Now let's look at what's happening here at the cathode with the copper. So my copper started in solution, remember, and then it was able to take electrons from the zinc and then embed itself on the rod, right? So we have first we have copper, which it was a copper ion, two plus, because it needed two electrons, but then it was an aqueous solution. The examiner wants to see that. But then the copper gains two electrons. Now you can see, if you have a number of electrons on this side of the equation sign, they were lost. If you have them on this side, they were then gained. Then I've got 2e minus, and then when the copper embeds itself, it is now a solid because it is on the rod. So this becomes Cu to represent that it's a solid. We have it as an S. So we call this, we can call this one the half oxidation, half reaction, and we can call this one the half reduction, half reaction. So the examiner can ask you to give these two reactions. And now remember, the minute you are giving these reactions, the examiner wants you to tell a story. Because if you can show this to any chemist, the, just by mere of them looking at the zinc and the, and the copper and just looking at the equations, they are then able to tell what is happening. Think of it as a love letter. If they write you, roses are red, violets are blue, you already know where it's going. So chemists feel exactly the same way. They can just read that whole equation, then they can already identify which one is the anode, which one is the cathode. I hope you're with me, Doc. But now another thing that the examiner can do to spice up this um, equation, they can actually give you this part. They can give you this part, and from this, you need to identify where oxidation and reduction take, took place. But now this is very easy. So they've given you the answer, but then you must work backwards, meaning you must work right back to the diagram. So make sure that you're actually able to read the equation as well as being given a diagram, and then you're able to read off the diagram. So that's one of the ways that the examiner can ask you the question.